warm welcome to everyone who has joined us. Um, thank you for being here um, in our today's webinar. My name is Ziki Ngobo and I'm the Global Coordinator at Academic Stand Against Poverty, which is also known as ASAP. ASAP is an international community of scholars and researchers working to confront the rules and practices that perpetuate global poverty and advocate for targeted evidence-based reforms. I'd also like to mention uh, to, that today's webinar is not only supported by ASAP, but by the Global Justice Program at Yale University and the Jesuit Justice and Eco Ecology Network Africa. So today we're going to be discussing how we can transform Africa's food systems, which will be presented by our numerous guests, um, as you can see on the screen right now. Um, we've got a number of experts uh, who are joining us and they'll be sharing a bit of their work and what they think is the best way forward when it comes to transforming Africa's food systems. You, I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Thomas Pogge, um, or Professor Thomas Pogge as he's known to his students. And I'm just gonna share a little bit about who he is and what he's done before he presents his, uh, his topic on the larger picture when it comes to poverty and progress. Uh, Dr. Thomas Pogge received his PhD in philosophy from Harvard. Um, he is a Leitner Professor of Philosophy and International Affairs and the founding director of the Global Justice Program at Yale University. He also co-founded ASAP as well as the Incentives for Global Health. Dr. Uh, Thomas Pogge, please go ahead and start your presentation. Hi, everyone. The US century starts around 1940 can't get it to move. Starts around 1940 with President Roosevelt's famous Four Freedom speech in which he promises a post-war world in which four freedoms will be achieved worldwide, including freedom from want, which will secure to every nation a healthy peacetime life for its inhabitants. Since 41, the gross world product has indeed increased 17 fold. So in that regard, Roosevelt was successful. This unprecedented growth has two components. Humanity increased by a factor of 3.5 from 2.3 to 8 billion people and global average income increased five fold. In 2022, Today, gross world product is 161 trillion international dollars. That's dollars in measured in purchasing power that a US dollar has in the United States. Dividing that, we find that the average income is 20,000 such dollars per person per year or 55 such dollars per person per day. As I said, five times as much as in 1941. If all segments of the human population had participated equally in economic growth, then even the poorest today would have five times as much income as one needs to survive. Now, some media make us believe that we are almost there, that poverty is rapidly disappearing. Here, this is from a discussion between Steven Pinker and Bill Gates, uh, telling you that hunger has essentially disappeared from this world. If only that were true, what you can see here is that in fact, the number of undernourished people was still 8% in 2015 and has been rising since that time to about 10% today. Now, remarkable about this FAO statistic is that the definition of undernourished that they use is extremely narrow. They consider only the energy content of food, ignoring deficiencies in vitamin A, other micronutrients and proteins and so on. They count all the food that is ingested, ignoring the fact that many poor people have absorption problems due to parasites. They draw the line at what is needed to cover even minimum needs for a sedentary lifestyle, ignoring that many poor people have to work for a living and very hard using a lot of calories. And it only counts as undernourished those people who fall short of that baseline for more than one year. Now, if we take a somewhat more generous conception of what it means to be undernourished, 
namely uh, the prevalence of food insecurity, we find that actually 29% of the human population are food insecure in 2021. And again, look at how that number has been rising. Things have gotten even worse in the last one and a half years through COVID and the war in Ukraine. As you can see here by looking at food prices, real food prices, food prices relative to prices of commodities in general, are higher than they have ever been since measurements began in 1961. Just at this time, of course, uh, we also have a crisis in energy. Energy prices are also very high. And so the rich countries, in their wisdom, have decided to increase biofuel production in order to reduce energy prices. And a huge chunk of the global food supply is actually diverted to biofuel, converted into ethanol and biodiesel. Maybe not a good time to increase it because that, of course, again, drives up food prices. It's not a long-term solution, but certainly it would help in the short run to reduce uh, the biofuel mandate. Here's another statistic. People unable to afford a healthy diet in 2020, that percentage is 42%. Now, many of us don't eat a healthy diet. We go to eat French fries and so on. But these are people who cannot afford a healthy diet, which the FAO assumes costs about three and a half dollars in per person per day in international dollars. So after the global average income is increased fivefold, we still have 42% of the human population who cannot afford a healthy diet costing $3.50. Now, this alerts us to the huge and increasing inequality in the world. You see here the global income distribution. This is the average income. Only 6% of the world's population have the average income or better. The other 94% have less. And here you can see those who have less than $5 a day those are the people who cannot afford a healthy diet costing $3.50 because they also have to buy clothing and shelter and so on. Food insecurity is not the only problem. Poor people suffer many other deprivations, lack of access to essential medicines, safe drinking water, adequate shelter, electricity, adequate sanitation. Many of them are still illiterate. And more than 160 million children do wage work out of their household. That is to say, they don't go to school. They don't get an education. They work. Increasing inequality, again, here you see it. The income has the income gap between the top 1% and the bottom 50% has been rising steadily. And today, the top 1% have four times as much income as the bottom 50%. This means that if we just reduced the income of the top 1% by one quarter, that would be enough to double all the incomes in the bottom half. Poverty and inequality are closely related. Mathematically, the less of a share the poor get, the poorer they are, of course. But also politically, the farther poor households fall below the average, the more underrepresented they tend to be in political decision making. So we find here two different factors that collaborate to achieve this enormous inequality that we find in the world today. There are the initial conditions deeply tainted by a history of colonialism, genocide, and slavery that was continued into the post-colonial period and led to international inequality up to 74 to 1, where the richest countries have 74 times the average income of the poorest countries. And then comes the second factor, the structuring of institutions and other rules and practices of national and international social systems, where, of course, those who have more resources can exert more political influence and can shape these rules and their application in their own favor thereby further enriching themselves by capturing an even larger share of the national and global product. Now, this regulatory capture is a very well-known phenomenon in economics. 
those who are the strongest in a given system have the greatest opportunities and incentives to achieve the expertise and coordination needed for effective regulatory capture. They increase their share and the shrinking share of the poor is then just a side effect of the successful efforts by the rich to shape the rules in their own favor. This has had a new dimension added to it through globalization, where suddenly a lot of the rules that govern our day-to-day -day lives have been shifted upward from the national to the global level, to the supranational level, and here again, the rich, the billionaires, the bankers, the uh, big multinationals have had a tremendous advantage in influencing this new global rulemaking through their governments, in particular through the US government, which is the most powerful player in international relations. It is also a democracy that is very much for sale in that in the US elections are privately funded and millions and millions, in fact, billions of dollars have to be raised each year for politicians to continue in office. So private agents are in a particularly good position to influence the US government to do its bidding in international negotiations. Here are some examples. Intellectual property rights that we innovate and pay for innovation through monopoly patents, which means poor people don't get access and the needs and interests of poor people are ignored by the innovators. Natural resource sovereignty. Rulers in developing countries can sell the resources of their country to foreigners, get money in exchange, and keep themselves in power, even if they lack any kind of democratic legitimation. No liability for externalities. So emissions, pollution, uh, the North is doing what it wants and doesn't pay for the cost and damages to the global South. There are no international labor standards that protect poor populations from a race to the bottom where poor countries offer ever more exploitable and abusable workforces to multinational corporations. And finally, the global tax system, which is dominated by a global tax haven industry where multinational corporations can reshuffle their profits from developing countries into tax havens and in that way avoid taxation. And of course, rich people in developing countries also avoid taxation by storing their funds in one of those global tax havens. That's it for my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Jorge. Uh, a very insightful presentation and does really show that we still have a long way to go before we can say that we are making that much of a progress to bridge the gap that you have just mentioned.